This week on The Perspective with Mike Sherpineau and Julie Stoutland, the complicated term godliness invokes in us all kinds of intimidating and freeing feelings. What does it actually mean to be godly? But today, thanks to best-selling author and speaker Brittany Ann, we get to find out from her perspective just what a godly woman is. Brittany Ann speaks from genuine, life-lived experience. And Tavares Gray is here to talk about godly dating and how people of different ages and stages can ensure they're on the right track on both sides of a loving relationship. The kids' ears sure are open on YouTube when Tavares speaks about godly dating. In a world where anything goes, most kids want guidance and direction. Plus, it sure seems the world these days is lacking leadership. From church leaders to politics, sports organizations, we see their leaders crumbling frequently. And now a new term in culture is quiet quitting as workers are frustrated with their leaders, the pandemic, their jobs. And so they enact quiet quitting to express their discouragement at lack of clear direction and purpose. To guide us through leadership today is world-renowned thought leader Tommy Spaulding, who gives us the credentials and tools we need to lead and love the people God puts in front of us and love the solid leaders among us. Now over to Mike and Julie with these amazing perspectives. Well, if you've been watching uh, what we've just been looking at together, you know we're in for an exciting, exciting week. Yeah. Just a a divergence of people. I know, I love it. I'm excited Mm -hmm. today that Tommy is gonna be with us as well. We're gonna talk to him in just a minute. Mm -hmm. But as usual, Julie, I've got my skill testing question. Okay. What is okay, it? because I think these questions just help people to get a glimpse into you and <laughs> me and the reality that life sometimes ha- has more than enough challenges. Yes, it does. So when you're having a bad day, mm-hmm. how do you change your mindset? I, I Many times I, I will listen to uh, worship music because I need something that uh, brings me up or some, um, some other Christian music. So worship music. music. Yeah. Okay. I'll just blast it. How about you? <laughs> well, I find a couple of things. One is... I need some time to be quiet. Mm. And I, I'm learning, trying to learn what it means to be still. You know, the Bible talks Ooh. a lot about being still and know that I'm God, but mm. what does it mean to be still? And then the other thing is I need to read. I need yeah. to read God's word and get refocused. And you know, having some good tunes in the background, <laughs> it, it always helps. Absolutely. But I thought, you know, helping us today with uh, just changing our perspective is Tommy Spaulding. Yes. And Tommy, I wanna welcome you today. Uh, you know, the credentials on how God has used you and what he's doing through your life mm-hmm. and leadership and inspiring people to look at their situation differently is so helpful. Yeah. And uh, I just thank you for coming on the program today. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Julie. And I'm also excited that your son plays hockey, as we shared <laughs> beforehand. That's good. Yeah. So you yeah. went way up in my, uh, cell, in my uh, <laughs> list of, uh, you know, what... Um, Make somebody, uh, you know, right up there. You, you can identify <laughs> with Canadians, and, uh, and that's important. Oh, and yeah. also where we're from, uh, mm. the whole area of the Niagara on the lake. So that's pretty cool. Mm. Tommy, you've had some uh, amazing experiences. You've written some fantastic mm. books, The Gift of Influence, Heart Led Leader, and it's not just who you know. I'm sure you got another book uh, in your mm. back pocket that's waiting mm. to come out. Well, what do you feel is the most important lesson you've learned as you speak and write on leadership? Yeah. Well, first, um, <clears throat> we look at Jesus as our as our spiritual role model, our Lord and Savior. But often we don't really look at him as our as our leadership role model. And I think Christians need to, to flip our heart and, and look at Jesus not only as our spiritual role model, but our, our leadership role model. And Jesus was a he was a servant leader. He got down on his feet and washed the feet of, you know, washed his disciples' feet. And it was all about putting others before himself. And um, after teaching leadership and studying leadership for almost 30 years, I, I've learned that there's two types of leaders. You're either a heart-led servant leader or you're a self-serving leader. And well, the choice is yours. And from that, let's talk about that for a moment. What's the difference yeah. between leading with your heart versus your head? Yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah. For years, we were told to bring our heads to work <laughs> and leave our hearts home. I mean, for years, you know, the smartest person in the room was often the leader. Mm. Um, and leading with the heart, we have to connect the head and the heart. And that's the journey of 18 inches. Mm. We still have to bring our heads to work, be strategic, analytical, thinkers, financially minded. But leaders that lead with love, with authenticity, 
that lead from the heart with vulnerability and truth and transparency and passion. Those are the leaders that are making a huge impact in the world today. Mm-hmm. Can you can you give me an example of that? Because it sounds wonderful, and it sounds like that's the kind of leader that I want to follow. Um, yeah, where have you seen that happening? Yeah, well, there's three types of people in the in the in the whole world, um, and I learned this when I was 15 years old at my first youth camp. There's leaders, there's followers, and there's critics. And okay. the world's full of critics, and the world needs leaders. They get the job done, but the world is starving for authentic leadership. And you ask a great question, Mike, about what, what you know. What kind of example is that? And the truth is that Jesus is the is the exact role model of how we should lead every day, by putting people before ourselves, by getting down on our feet and washing the feet of our disciples and our our followers, and to lead our life in a very humble, genuine way. You know, it, it seems in in church, politics, and mm-hmm. sports, there's a real lack of leadership and institutions come crumbling down and workers are frustrated with their leaders, the pandemic, their jobs, yeah. and are, as we talk about, enacting a quiet quitting to express their yeah. discouragement uh, at the lack of leadership and clear direction, purpose. Yeah. What do you know about this? Yeah. So leadership in any organization, whether it's sports or politics or athletics or business or nonprofits, leadership is the problem. And leadership is the solution. Mm. And the organizations that are thriving in the world today have leaders that truly get heart-led servant leadership and truly get the power of of influence. Because that's what leadership is all about, is influencing the lives of others, changing lives, making lives better, and, you know, shining our Jesus light. Not saying the words Jesus, but acting and showing the words Jesus through our actions every day. Mm. Tommy, I want to go down a road. We didn't discuss this, but it's something that's been on my mind um, mm. for a couple of days. And we were kibitzing a little bit about your son who likes to play hockey, and that's all good. Canadians mm. have really prided themselves in their hockey association. Mm. And I don't know whether you're aware of it, but there's been a big blowout about sexual exploitation, and there have been payoffs uh, behind the doors. And mm. uh, just before we recorded this episode with you, I was listening to the news. And now they're out to lynch all the leadership in the uh, hockey organization in Canada. Even our prime minister is weighing in on it. And the leadership doesn't want to step down. They're saying, no, we've handled things correctly. But, you know, people are looking for blood. Talk to me mm-hmm. about leadership in that scenario. What do you do? Do you, you know, tuck your tail behind your leg and just resign and walk away? What if you actually feel that you've done the right thing? Yeah. And that's that's the powerful thing about leadership is there's no right or wrong answer. It's what's it's really what the truth in your heart is telling you. That news hasn't trickled down to this to the states yet, but I will tell you that um I have two boys, a stepson that's at West Point that uh, plays club hockey and a 14-year-old boy that's living uh at Shattuck St. Mary's in Minnesota, um oh. prep school playing hockey and I think we were the only uh, Americans in this bar years ago when America was playing the Canadians in the, the Olympics. And when uh, the Canadians scored that goal to win the game, everyone was booing. And I had three, two boys screaming and yelling, cheering, and I thought I was going to get killed. Um, <laughs> but to answer your question, Mike, you know, if, if, if you believe that, that what you're saying is truthful, you know, then you got to stay the course and, and, can, and, and, and stay, you know, communicating the truth. But also leadership is also humility. And when you feel like you've done something wrong, you got to step aside and be humble and and know that you got to let the other people lead uh, next. Mm. You know, um, years ago, I used to be a motivational speaker in schools, elementary and high school and that. And I see that you have founded uh, a youth leadership program. And it just made me think about years ago and even up to now, are you seeing a difference in how youth are viewing leadership? and in a better way or worse way? And, and how can we make it better or what can we do about that? Yeah. Their view I've been of work, Yeah. I've been working with high school kids all over the world mm. for almost 25 years. And what I love about high school kids is they demand truth. Yes. They, they, can, smell, <laughs> they can smell BS. They, if they you're sure not can. Real, I love it. <laughs> if you're not authentic, they'll just spit you out. Exactly. And, um, <laughs> what I'm learning, my own daughter, you know, she loves Jesus. And, you know, on Friday night, she'd rather go volunteer to Hope, you know, soup kitchen. And, mm. you know, at summertime, instead of going to Disneyland, she'd rather go to Mexico and build homes with Homes for Hope. And there's just this wave of young people that ha- want to give back to the community, that want to do good in the world, that want a relationship with Jesus. 
Um, the problem is, is that their leaders are not often great role models. And that's mm. what we're trying to do. Yeah. Wow. So we're going to unpack that a little bit more in just a moment. I want you to stay with us as we're with Tommy Spalding right now. We're going to come back and talk more about the heart-led leader and uh, the gift of influence. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tommy, we're glad you're with us. And to our listeners, yeah. stay with us. We'll be right back. When I was 15 years old, I went to my first leadership development program. It was called RILA, Rotary Youth Leadership Academy. And I was a sophomore in high school. I was totally naive to what leadership was all about. And I remember the keynote speaker, Tom France, he's passed away now, but he was a Rotarian and he was talking about servant leadership. And at the end of his speech, he said something that I'll never forget. He said, there's three types of people in the whole entire world, three types of people. There's leaders, there's the followers, and there's the critics. And then he said it, another question, which was like life-changing. He said, which one are you gonna be? Well, we're back right now with Tommy Spaulding as we talk more about the power of influence, as we talk about leadership and the things that he has learned. And as we were just talking in the first interview, especially with his influence with high school students, and that is one of the, the very daunting things, Tommy, but it's very refreshing is that they're looking for authenticity. And uh, like, don't give me any... Uh, I'm trying to think of the correct word, but yes, yeah, 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 there's yeah. a word there that I'm not allowed to say on air. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm just going to shut my mouth and we'll move on. How do you uh, communicate with the high school students? What's your yeah. go-to? Yeah, you do, they, they, love to they love to hear stories mm. and they don't want to be told what to do. Mm. They just want to, they want to just, you know, watch your actions. And that's what the the biggest thing is, and if every high school kid I, I talk to, I say, if you can ingrain four words in your heart, if you ever got a tattoo, I'm not a tattoo guy, but if you ever got a tattoo, just tattoo it on your arm, four words. It's not about you. Mm. The whole world, most of us live, it's all about us. But oh, the yeah. great leaders, the great Christians, the great followers of Jesus, it's not about you. Every day it's about serving others. That's so interesting. A few months ago, we had another uh, a guest on, and she she actually teaches in school about how to develop empathy in elementary school children, and how we yeah. need to learn that it's it's mm -hmm. not about us. So yeah. that's yeah. that's really great. Listen, I, I want to go on and ask why why does helping and and promoting others promote our own worth? Let's yeah. let's tackle that. Yeah, you know, if there's a great line of of, of competence and humility. When you have too much confidence, you have this arrogance mm -hmm. and you have too much humility. You don't have the confidence to actually lead. And there's this fine line that you want to hit where you can have deep, deep confidence. Like, you know, exactly who you are and, and, and your, and your, and your abilities you're confident in, but then you also match that with unbelievable humility. Mm -hmm. And when you have those two, uh, it's powerful. You can really lead. Yeah. So how do you with. get that confidence? Mm -hmm. How do you, what would you say to someone saying, how can I lead with confidence and make wise decisions? Well, first, everything you do, you got to know you're doing it uh, for, for Christ. And mm. when, you, when you're serving a, a higher power, you're, you're able to, to be able to lead people in a way where people are going to feel your confidence because you know you're coming from a higher power. I think it's the humility piece that, um, that we need to all work on. And humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less often. Mm. And I, I think I like that. that's just what we have to work on. But but it really influence is really the the magical thing that um, that leadership is really all about. The power of influence. Mm. I know for myself too. I I'm constantly reminding myself there's always more to learn. Like even mm. when there's some area you feel like I've got this, and you just flow, and it seems like it's, you know it just like the back of your hand, your hand, you know your name. There's always more to learn. And I remind myself of that constantly. I, I want to go on and ask as well, how, how are emotions tied to good leadership? Uh, I know that I'm a very emotional person. So yeah, I'm sure I'm not no, the only no, one. That's not true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How yeah. are emotions tied to good leadership? Yeah. yeah. When, I was a, when I was a kid, my dad was a school teacher and um, he cried a lot. Mm. You know, he'd be playing the piano and play, playing a song. He'd be emotional or, you know, seeing a movie, he'd be emotional. And so I was raised watching a, a dad that it was okay to cry. Mm. And I, I have a lot of Canadian friends and crying is not one of their strong suits. Um, <laughs> and, and I have a lot of American friends too that, that are that way. And what I've learned, again, I've been coaching leaders now, Fortune 500 companies for almost 25 years. And the leaders that can get up 
and talk about their families and mm. talk about you know, um, obstacles and talk about shortcomings and talk about failures and get emotional in a very authentic way. It is amazing uh, the results that happen and the, the, their followers, their employees, their customers, mm. their clients just love them. And I believe that leaders are either loved or respected or both. Mm. Like, do you love or respect your leaders? And you respect your leaders because they have integrity, they work hard, they're smart, they get results done, they're talented, they're charismatic. Mm. But to really love your leader, you have to know their heart. And yeah. they got it. And the way to, to really know a leader's heart is when a leader is vulnerable. And to answer your question, Julie, to have emotion and to mm. care. And not just be a PowerPoint clicker talking about results and talk speaking from your head, connect the head and the heart and lead from this place of love. Um, your followers are really going to be there uh, for the long term. Let me uh, let me push that. back a little bit on that one, because sure. what's going through my mind as you describe that, first of all, it's very appealing. Um, mm -hmm. I want to work for somebody like that. And hopefully uh, <laughs> people are, are going to think that of me. But uh, as they're listening in right now, I'm not going to ask them not to vote. <laughs> um, but what about loyalty because mm. you know you talk about this whole thing of quiet quitting that mm. seems to be one of the the hallmarks of the last couple of years people just leaving i'd like you to reference that but where does loyalty fit in and and even if i have a great leader am i expected to stay if i get a better job offer yeah you know just yesterday i was talking to a guy named mark miller he's an executive for chick-fil-a chick-fil-a is a pretty big yep um you know, in North America, probably one of the most profitable restaurants in the world. And we were, we're having this conversation about quiet quitting. And we're having this conversation about so many restaurants, hotels, hospitality, industry all over North America are struggling to keep employees. And, you know, and I was even telling them there's a Chick-fil-A down our street that was closed on lunch because they couldn't have employees. I said, if a Chick-fil-A is having a hard time, you know, getting employees <laughs> to work, you know, what's happening? And I was expecting his answer to be something about culture and leadership, you know, training and, and, and employee training and, and payroll and, you know, and employee benefits and how to keep people working. And he basically said, it's a leadership problem. Mm. The, you know, he said the Chick-fil-A stores that are thriving, that have great leaders, you know, don't have, are not closing at lunch. Wow. And the, the, the Chick-fil-A stores that are closing at lunch because they can't get employees is because the leadership isn't really developing their people and loving their people mm -hmm. and building loyal employees to answer your question. My loyalty is, is, is about a relationship between an employee and employer. And when an employee feels, uh, you know, is loyal is because there's love between the two of them and love, meaning not the words love, I love you, but mm -hmm. the act of love, showing love right. that you care, that you're authentic, you're genuine, you feel valued. That's mm -hmm. how you create loyalty. So is that the greater part of the vision as opposed to, hey, we want to sell so many uh, sandwiches? <laughs> probably, probably. You know, I um, I heard a, um, a saying uh, a few years ago that changed my life. And it's the reason why I wrote this next book, The Gift of Influence, that um, the average human being on the planet influences 80,000 people in their life. When I first heard that, the average human being influences 80,000 people in our lifetime. That's a lot of people. It just hit me. And so, Julia, what I did is I got to the math, 80,000 people. If you divide that by 78 years, which is the average life expectancy of a human being on the planet, and you divide that by 365 days, you get wow. 2.8 people a day. Mm. 2.8 people a day. So the mm. time we're born, Julia and Mike, the time we die, our 78 years, hopefully longer, on the planet, we meet and we have the opportunity to influence 2.8 mm. people a day. And you do that 365 days a year, every year for 78 years, that's 80,000 people. And I started thinking, what if at the end of our lives, yeah, we actually got to meet all 80,000 of those people. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. like, because we don't meet all these people we meet. The do I have to remember Starbucks, their name? I hope. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and some are just transactional, like yeah. the barista at Starbucks or, you know, the Uber driver, but right. some of your, your neighbors, your employees, that you know, you know, customers, like, but we have relationships. Mm -hmm. And so- yeah. I just, I just have this picture in my head that what if we all walked on the 50 yard line of a, of a stadium, football stadium or soccer stadium there with 80,000 people, every single person that we've influenced in our life from the time we're born to the time we die, all 2.8 people, 80,000 people in the stadium. And we walk right before we're about Amazing. to die, go to Jesus, yeah. right before we're about to go to Jesus, we get on the 50 yard line 
and we just walk in the stadium and everybody's in that stadium. And the question that I want to ask the world is, what's the sound of that stadium? I mean, are they clapping? Are they screaming? Are they standing ovation because you've changed their life? You've given them a chance. You've, you've listened to their story. You've helped them. You've mentored. You've loved them. Or is the stadium booing? Because you just mm. hurt people and thought about yourself your whole life and wow. put uh, you know put yourself before others, wow. or worse, is the wow. stadium silent? Is it just silent? Because we're, we're people looking at down on our phones all day and not looking up, and and we don't really actually have an impact on people. Every day we have an opportunity to influence two point eight people. Every day God puts two point eight new people. Some of us, five people, 10 people, 20 people. Every day we meet people. And the question is, what kind of influence you're going to have on them? A positive or negative one? The choice is ours. Wow. Tommy, what you have said has just been powerful. Yeah. I mean, you have influenced us just through that illustration. And my frustration is that our time is gone mm. and we got to wrap it up today. Mm. But your latest book, The Gift of Influence, mm. uh, I want to encourage people to get it. Just go to um, yeah. Amazon and uh, mm. you can find it there. Uh, Tommy uh, Spaulding, thank you so much yes. for influencing us today. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, Julie. Thanks. Well, we're glad you're back with us. And that was just an inspiring interview, that conversation. I, was just saying, I don't even think interview is the right word. I just wanted yeah. to listen. What, what an image burned into my mind about standing in that stadium and thinking that I could have 80,000 people that I have personally influenced throughout life. And the question being, are they going to be celebrating? Are they going to be booing? Or are they going to be indifferent? Wow, what a challenge. Yeah, my mind was left spinning with that and also wondering, saying, okay, I think we... The natural thing is we want them all to be cheering. Oh, I know, I know. But and what does I, that and, look like? Well. <laughs> and I think I have an idea. Oh, okay. What is your idea? Well, I think the idea is going to come out of the teaching today because Tommy referenced that as well. I said mm. it starts with knowing Jesus. Mm. And what does that mean to know Jesus and to be known by him and to be impacted with the love of Christ? Because yeah. that causes us to do things we normally say, wouldn't do. Yeah, you wouldn't normally do. I know myself, there have been so many times where it is up being the plumb line for me, where I'm like emotionally, I'm not always having the wonderful emotions or I may be going off this way, but that plumb line of Christ going, what would Jesus do? How should I be loving this person through this situation? That always gets me. Let me talk to you for a few moments and also to our listeners about what I think is the transition point and uh, through this week, I want to talk about the subject of grace, God giving us what we don't deserve. It's that relationship with Jesus that Tommy was talking about that should impact the way that we do life. And whether you're an employee or an employer, you have an opportunity to influence people as you allow yourself to come under the influence of Jesus, regardless of your situation. And through this week, I want to teach from the book of Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, at certain points, it's kind of heavy going. It's often referred to as a, a theological treatise. And, uh, you know, this early in the morning, I'm not sure I can even spell theological, so just bear with me. But the understanding of who God is and how it impacts us is critical. And Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, he's talking to the church and he's reminding them of who they were. He said, at one point you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked. Those words, trespasses and sin, they're not politically correct. But Paul says, you know what? You were far from God. You were, you were completely dead. Uh, I'm remembering back in grade 11, a long time ago, but you know, early morning calculus classes, it was like Sleepy Hollow. We were kind of cruel what we would do, but we would pick on somebody in the class and we'd put a tack on their seat. I know you're not supposed to do those things, and I'm confessing it now because I think my teacher is dead and gone. And I remember people coming in, and especially one guy, he sat down and he caught the tack and he jumped up and uh, said a few things that you're not supposed to say and got reprimanded. And we're all laughing and snickering, but the, the picture that comes to my mind is that 
in our own life, not even the tack would wake us up. Paul says you were dead. He says you were corpses. And we don't often realize the the grip the world has upon us. We get caught up in a lifestyle. We get caught up in pursuing certain things and saying, you know, if I only have that, then I will be happy. What Tommy was talking about, and as he talks about his book, in his book, you know, showing influence, as we think about the Jesus way, it's a way that truly impacts us to give out of our own emptiness. And when we empty ourselves, then Christ can fill us to overflowing. That's why Paul wrote, when I'm weak, then I am strong. So that the power of Christ can be seen in my life. Now, we all have a choice. And if we have the picture of standing in the stadium, I think that, you know, people will look on and and be somewhat indifferent to us unless we choose how we're going to live. And so when Paul describes about how dead they were before they met Christ, he's talking about spiritually and even emotionally. He says some things to uh, back up his statement. He talks about, you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you once walked following the course of this world. The idea of once walk, it it actually speaks of uh, how you're manipulated by the lifestyle around you. Have you ever thought about that for a moment? Could it be that the way that you're living right now is really uh, creating deadness? It's taking away the life that God wants you to live because you're not your own person. He also says that people were actually energized by Satan. Again, a, a kind of uncomfortable conversation, but I'm intrigued that as we become more progressive and more filled with knowledge, that the world actually today is talking about that why they believe in God, they also believe in Satan. And the scriptures talk about Satan. It says, you were influenced by him. I don't want to go down on record like that. Because Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. So daily, I need to say, Lord, I want you to live through me by your Holy Spirit so that I can walk with you, so that I can experience your grace. And in a couple of days as we journey through this passage, we're going to get to where Paul talks about By grace, we are saved through faith, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. And one of the characteristics of living by grace is that we're going to be obedient to the nudge of God in our heart. I think that's what's going to make the the people in the stands stand up and applaud because we will have followed after Jesus. We're following after a different drummer, not to our own drumbeat. And I want to encourage you to take the step of faith today and to say, Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to no longer be controlled and dominated by my flesh, by Satan, by the influence of all my friends around us. I want to be unique. I want to be the person that you've created me to be. And can I invite you to rise up and stand in that calling, stand in that strength today to be all that God has called you to be. 